Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wilson Centre. My name is Bryce Wakefield. I'm Asia Pro uh, an Asia Program Associate here at the Centre, um, and it's my pleasure to see you all here today. Um, judging by the turnout, uh, there's a fair amount of interest in, uh, uh, in uh, intelligence or, or how intelligence on North Korea is produced and disseminated here in Washington. Um, and given the caliber of the speakers today, I'm sure we'll have a lot said on North Korea, which is intelligent. Before I introduce our speakers, however, let's, let me take a moment to introduce the Wilson Center, uh, for those of you who haven't been, been here before and for those of you who are watching off-site. The Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars is the nation's official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. Unlike other presidential memorials on the Mall, the Wilson Center seeks to honor President President Wilson's role as a scholar, as well as his role as a president, by inviting um, world-class scholars to do policy-related research here in Washington. We also pride ourselves on introducing new and fresh pers perspectives, often from scholars based outside the Beltway, to policy debates here in Washington. Today's event was organized by the Asia Program, which provides a forum for bringing historical depth and contemporary understanding of Asia to the nation's capital. The director of the Asia Program is Robert Hathaway, who is here with us today. Um, and we are co-sponsored by the North Korea International Documentation Project, or NKIDP, uh, which falls under the History and Public Policy Program whose director, Christian Osterman, I believe is also here today. Our first speaker, James Person, is the project coordinator of the NKIDP. And by way of introducing the project, um, you'll have some idea of the outstanding job that James does for the center and for the production of knowledge on North Korea. The North Korea International Documentation Project collects historical documents on North Korea from Pyongyang's past and present allies, translates those documents, collates them, and makes them freely available to historians and policymakers. It also coordinates oral history sessions where former international diplomats dealing with North Korea shed light on past events so that we may better understand North Korea today. It's a truly unique and outstanding project, and I encourage you all to familiarize yourselves with it. James is currently completing a PhD at George Washington University, focusing on the origins and evolution of North Korea's Juche ideology between 1953 and 1967. Our next speaker, Bob Carlin, is well known in the world of policymakers who work on North Korea. He spent 30 years, or over 30 years, in the intelligence community, working almost exclusively on DPRK-related issues. From 1989 to 2002, he was the chief of the Northeast Asia Division in the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, and intelligence advisor to the chief US, US negotiators, and therefore involved in all key US DPRK negotiations during that time. He was also the, the political advisor to the executive director of the Korean Peninsula Economic Development Organization, or KEDO, from 2002 to 2007. He's currently a visiting scholar at Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation. Our next speaker, Dae Suk Su, is an expert on the leadership of North Korea and is author of what is often considered to be the biography of Kim Il-sung. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of Hawaii, uh, where he was the director of the Center for Korean, Korea Studies between 1972 and 1995. He's also held a number of academic positions in Northeast Asia, namely at Seoul National University and Yonsei University in Korea, Keio University in Japan, and Yambian University in China. We're also extremely proud that in 1985, he was a visiting scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, although back then we were based across the mall in the castle. Finally, we'll hear from Jae Jong Su, Professor Su, unfortunately had a class um, until just after 3 
p.m. today, so um, he will be coming a little late, but I'll introduce him now in any case. He's uh, Associate Professor and uh, Director of Korea Studies at John, John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He's also held positions at Cornell, Seoul National University, Yonsei University, MIT, and the University of California, Irvine. He's also a former recipient of, uh, of a Fulbright Hayes Faculty Research Fellowship and a Smith Richardson Foundation grant, and was a fellow at both the MacArthur, MacArthur Foundation and the East West Center. Okay, so um, if you could join me in welcoming our speakers here today. And I'm sure, I'm sure we're all eager to hear what they have to say, so I'll pass the floor over to James. Thank you, Bryce. Um, the North Korea International Documentation Project is very happy to be co-sponsoring this event with Bryce, but really all credit uh, goes to, to Bryce. He, um, I just returned on Monday from a two-month trip to Seoul where I was gathering more documents. Um, and uh, in my absence, um, Bryce really really uh, did a yeoman's job in, in order, organizing this panel. Um, now, at the risk of sounding overly um, didactic, I'd like to start um, by asking two simple but enormously important epistemological questions. Um, first, how do we know what we think we know about North Korea? Um, and second, um, how is knowledge about North Korea produced? Um, now, it's important to, to approach any subject uh, of inquiry with a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, and most analysts do uh, when, when, when they comment on, on um, other countries. Yet, it seems this skepticism um, at times rarely extends to analysis on North, of North Korea, which is arguably one of, one of the most secretive nations in the world. Um, arguably the most <laughs> secretive. Um, now, our ability to obtain reliable information on North Korea remains limited um, and, uh, because of, of over six decades of, of, of uh, diplomatic non-recognition um, of North Korea. Um, yet there's, there's no shortage of opinions and, and, and no um, shortage of, of experts um, on North Korea. Um, Yet with, with the, the emergence of, of new materials from the archives of North Korea's former communist allies, um, we, can, we can actually begin to, to re-examine what we think we know about North Korea. Um, when looking at these materials, and, and these materials come from, um, actually we're now getting some North Korean materials, but they come largely from uh, Chinese, Russian, Czech, Polish, Hungarian, Albanian, Romanian, um, East German archives. What becomes clear when looking at these documents is is that really what we think we know is about North Korea is, has largely been influenced by um, such things as the the Cold War enmity between the two Koreas, um, the enmity between the United States and and and, and North Korea. Um, there are other influences, such as um, uh, uh, I mean, these. Um, what we think we know about North Korea often reflects the official North Korean position on on things. Um, uh, surprisingly, the, uh, what we think we know about North Korea also reflects J imperial Japanese propaganda. Um, I, I, actually, let me just give you one example. Um, anyone who has read a history of North Korea knows that um, um, Kim Il-sung's position in, in North Korea was largely unassailable um, from the late 1950s after he artfully exploited uh, factional rivalry, rivalries to consolidate his, his own position. Um, he purged these factions um, finally in the late 1950s. Um, uh, and and um, uh, eliminated all outside influence in the party. Um, what we're finding in these documents is that this this is not entirely accurate. Um, these uh, you didn't have really a factional rivalry in the Korean Workers Party um, through the 1950s. You had um, instead policy debate 
um, over development strategies. And, and after three years um, of, of, of ongoing debate and discussion about which development strategy to adopt, um, Kim Il-sung simply, um, well, declared that, that the people who were supporting the, this alternative development strategy were factionalists and, 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 and purged them. This was a, a Maoist technique. Um, uh, so these factions became ontological realities only after Kim Il-sung called them factionalists. There were, there were no grouping agents that were strong enough to, um, to have actually created these factions beforehand. Uh, this is um, uh, just, I mean, but this is something that is widely known. I mean, it, it, we all know that there were factions in North Korea. Um, so we really have to, to go back and, and completely re-examine what we think we know about North Korea. Um, now, this is one historical episode, um, but um, there are other cases where our misunderstandings of North Korea have a real effect on our, on our ability to formulate effective policies. And today I want to focus on two particular cases where we do need to re-examine what we think we know about, about the North. Now, in both of these cases, um, policies are being formulated based on, on misconceptions. Um, the first of these is, is in viewing China as a country with, with tremendous influence um, or leverage over North Korea. Now, the second um, uh, issue I'm going to um, examine today is um, this assumption that North Korean leaders seek, and, and, uh, seek reform and, and integration into the international system. Um, now, there's one thing that's central to both of these um, both of these these uh, subjects, and, and that is sovereignty. North Korean, uh, North Korea's um, uh, desire to well, North, uh, how North Korea jealously guards its its sovereign prerogatives, uh, perhaps more so than any other nation um, on earth. And, and 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 the reason for this is is because um, the North. North Korean leaders see the world, or they view the world filtered through the lens of the Japanese colonial experience. Um, this is important to understand. Um, and and they, they see the, the system that, this tributary system that existed in East Asia uh, through the end of the 19th century as the reason for Korea, or the reason that Korea was unable to defend its sovereignty from Japan in 1910, actually 100 years ago, I think last week. Um, so the North Koreans, um, they, they, they saw this tributary system as really the, the downfall of the Chosun dynasty. And, and, and they are determined to prevent Korea from ever or prevent North Korea from ever um, uh, repeating um, something like that again, um, and 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 uh, therefore, um, are, are uh, whenever uh, an ally, um, for example, um, attempts to to um, influence North Korean policy, they immediately um, uh, uh, react negatively. Um, uh, suggesting that this this country or, or is is attempting to to meddle in, in North Korea's internal affairs, um, at the same time they are, are uh, reluctant to become integrated into any, any systems, um, uh, international systems, because they're they're afraid of, of jeopardizing their sovereignty. But I'll get into these um, in more detail in a, mo in a moment. First, uh, let's look at this the Sino DPRK alliance. Now, I think the most important thing here is that many people confuse influence with, well, they, they actually they confuse access with influence. Now there's no doubt that China has more access than any country to North Korea, but this does not necessarily translate to, to um, leverage over the North. Um, the reason for this is that, that the North truly does not trust China. Uh, this, this has been a very, very, very rocky relationship throughout the, the 60 years, starting in the, with the Korean War, in fact. Um, and I've spoken about this here at the center before. Um, um, the, the, the Chinese have at times um, acted in a manner that the North Koreans perceived as an attempt to reassert their traditional hegemony over Korea. During the Korean War, for example, you had 
uh, a foreign military apparatus controlling um, field operations. They took took control of the of of uh, the fighting. Um, this, of course, made Kim Il Sung very uncomfortable. Um, there were also personal rivalries um, or uh, animosities between Kim Il Sung and the um, head of the Chinese People's Volunteers, Peng Dehui. Um, relations were actually um, uh, quite uh, shaky immediately after the Korean War. Um, and you see this in a lot of the documents that we're obtaining where the, um, the Soviets were expressing concern that the relationship between um, China and, and North Korea was, um, um, was, was not um, very friendly. And, and, and the Chinese were intentionally avoiding North Koreans at uh, diplomatic receptions. Um, within a few years of the end of the Korean War, in 1956, China and the Soviet Union directly interfered in a, um, an internal party uh, matter um, the, the August, following the August plenum of the Korean Workers' Party um, Central Committee. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the, no question about it. They, there was, there was, um, they directly meddled in internal party affairs. And Kim Il Sung would refer to this in, uh, years and years later um, in in conversations with with other communist leaders, um, how he was disturbed by by China and and the Soviet Union's um, uh, interventionist policies um, uh, and uh, uh, big power chauvinism. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, again, we had um, China meddling in internal party affairs. There were even disputes, uh, armed clashes along the, the, the Sino-DPRK border in the vicinity of, of Pekdu Mountain. Um, and uh, famously, the, the Chinese opposed in 1980 the succession of, of Kim Jong-il. Um, uh, so uh, the North Koreans have very good reason not to um, not to trust China completely, um, not to um, well, and, and to be concerned about China reasserting their their traditional hegemony over the Korean Peninsula. Um, for that reason, I, I was um, I'm, I'm surprised that we are asking um, China to to become so involved in in. Well, it, it, we we asked China to do our dirty work by bringing the North Koreans back to the six party talks. We we asked the Chinese to um, become more and more involved in um, uh, um, in in helping us uh, approach the North. What we're essentially doing is we're asking the Chinese to do precisely what the North Koreans have most resented over the past six decades. Um, I'm I'm also uh, given given this this shaky relationship over the past six decades. I'm also surprised that so many people would. I mean, I, I was amazed. Um, I was reading in Seoul um, reports uh, of, of this recent trip to China that Kim Jong Il made, um, and everyone just matter of factly said, "Well, he's going to secure uh, China's blessing for the succession of of, of uh, this this third son." Um, a country that so jealously guards their sovereign prerogatives would never um, go to another country to uh, to to. I mean, that, that, this is something that that Chosun leaders had done. Uh, um, uh, to they would uh, when when this tributary system existed, but it's unconscionable to think that North Korea today would would request the the. Uh, the blessing of China, um, uh, especially when when Kim Jong Il's um, succession was was uh, was actually um, uh, criticized by the Chinese in 1980. Um, another another thing that that we need to be more mindful of when um, formulating policy or when when coming up with policies, this idea that um, well, we need to be more mindful of the history of, of past attempts to open up North Korea, or to, become, or to, to get North Korea to integrate into international systems. There have been a number of task reports recently um, suggesting that we can uh, uh, engage North Korea 
um, and um, engage North Korea ec- economically, and that North Korea will will likely open like China and and uh, Vietnam. Um, there's you really have to go back and and look at past attempts to um, uh, by friends and foes alike to engage North Korea um, economically. Um, let's look, for example, at the you know starting with with the post-war reconstruction of North Korea. Here we have the 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 largest bailout, perhaps in the history of the world, of a country. You have you have every communist country contributing something, either cash or or in kind. Yeah, I mean, from from China and the Soviet Union giving roughly one third each of of the total budget to countries like uh, uh, Mongolia providing. Um, I think they were providing um, uh, livestock, um, but this was this was a, a a major bailout, and yet they could not get North Korea to join the International Division of Labor Comic Con because North Korea was concerned about um, well, Kim Il Sung did not believe that he could actually carry out his his. Uh, um, uh, his goals for um, uh, the reunification. Um, if 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 he were to to become integrated into this system, um, the reason is the Soviets were encouraging North Korea to to forego industrialization because there were already countries producing products in 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 Eastern Europe, more developed countries in Eastern Europe. Um, um, so there was no need to to reinvent the wheel. They, they suggested to Kim Il Sung, why don't you export your raw materials and marine products to us? Um, for Kim, this was unconscionable. It was essentially asking, I mean, uh, kicking away the ladder. And Kim Il Sung asked um, the the uh, uh, Soviet leaders, um, "What what happens when we're no longer allies? Um, and and you know, what what's going to happen to us then?" Um, for him, um, as I said, it was it was like kicking away the ladder. They were they were um, uh, not. Taking into consideration um, uh, North Korea's uh, uh, concerns, uh, I mean the fact that there was South Korea and and the magnet that an industrialized North Korea could be um, for South Korean people, um, or this is how Kim Il Sung at least thought. Um, there were other attempts um, after this period, of course, to open North Korea and to integrate North Korea. The Chinese, after they opened um, opened up their their economy. Um, um, uh, encourage North Korea and continue to encourage North Korea. Um, they'll, uh, um, the North Koreans um, uh, are uh, will at times um, uh, make minor changes that that are a little more than stopgap measures, but there's no real sign that they that they are are making any any. Um, uh, real uh, reforms. Um, South Korea, of course, with with the Sunshine Policy, uh, attempted to open North Korea, uh, or to to integrate North Korea into the the international system, and North Korea um, resisted all of it. They were willing to receive, but they weren't willing to reciprocate in any way. Um, and um, uh, sadly, um, in the end, it it. it uh, North Korea um, was was more willing to allow millions of people to starve to death than risk the in- increase of foreign influence um, uh, through the transformation of of, uh, of their their political economy in exchange for financial assistance. Um, so to expect uh, Washington, therefore, to succeed in 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 engaging North Korea and opening North Korea, where um, the socialist socialist bloc and um, South Korea um, failed um, seems to, to be taking up this idea of American exceptionalism to a new extreme. Um, so, the the, the uh, just just to, to in closing, I, uh, so I'm writing two minutes over there. Um, in closing, um, we really need to to be mindful of the fact that that. Um, because of this, this six decade, six decades of non diplomatic non recognition, um, we are really um, uh, it, it, it's it's difficult for us to to um, uh, to really or we we really need to be much more cautious in in 
um, and, and much more um, uh, skeptical when, um, when in, in developing policies. We need to be much more conscious of, of North Korea's uh, broader history um, because the North Korean leaders attach so much importance to history themselves. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so be mindful of this in, in formulating our policies because otherwise, I mean, the, the policies are, can be doomed to failure. Um, with that, thank you, Bryce. Great. Thanks very much, James. Bob? <coughs> Nothing to press. Okay. You hear me? Yes. Okay, good. A little closer. How's that? Ah, sound of my own voice. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Wilson Center for inviting me, give me a chance to come downtown. <clears throat> I don't get downtown very often. And I, whenever I do, especially in the summertime, I'm impressed again at what a sweet, sleepy, self-important town this is. <laughs> and the town that it reminds me most of in some ways is not obviously New York or Paris or London or Hamburg <coughs> it's Pyongyang <laughs> the physical plant of this town and the sort of the lassitude uh, there are a lot of similarities. It's very, very funny. In fact, if you stand, as I did, at the corner of, a, I think it was 12th and E Street, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, 12th and E Street in the capital of the strongest country on earth, there's not much more traffic than there is in Pyongyang. Very, very striking. Um, I don't draw any conclusions. I just like to make observations sometimes and, and uh, let them percolate in my brain a little bit. So the question, question is, how confident are we in our ability to know North Korea? And I was asked to comment thoughtfully on that issue. Uh, thoughtfully, that's the Everest of public meetings like this. It's a very high, high bar. But um, I once had extremely strong feelings about this problem when I was in the midst of the combat within the intelligence community. We, we wrestled and fought vigorously, hammer and tong over this. Fortunately, I'm retired, and uh, time really does heal old wounds, and memory fades, and so I think I can be thoughtful on this without jumping out of my seat, perhaps. The question, though, is confident in whose judgments? The question was, how can we be confident in our ability to know North Korea? Well, as Tonto said to the Lone Ranger, what you mean our? <laughs> Who's us in this case? This analysis of North Korea and this um, integration of all the knowledge, historical and current, that James was talking about, this is a full-time job, full-time job. And what that means is that the common wisdom of the part-time commentators and uh, what I call the policy dilettantes really doesn't have any place in this game. They fill the op-ed pages and they crowd into the airwaves, of course, but as, as we heard James suggest, um, a lot of that is hot air and empty words. This is the public arena. The question, I suppose, next is what about the more formal ability of the lavishly funded U.S. government programs? that are supposed to get at this, these answers to these questions. Actually, s well, I won't give a grade yet. We'll give a grade at the end, perhaps, when we examine 
<clears throat> a little bit more closely what's strong about these programs and what is not, not so strong. You can divide probably the fundamental um, problem into two parts. Um, processes and people. We certainly don't lack for collection capabilities, especially technical co collection. We can collate mounds of material, we can distribute it instantaneously all over Washington and all over the world. When I started many years ago at this, I was brand, brand new. And they took us around, all the new analysts around, to see the operations of, this was the CIA. And there was this fellow with, you know, this rubber thing on his thumb, going through a mound of paper like this. At warp speed, able to distribute these hundreds of pages that had come in. We still did things by hand back then. And it worked pretty well. Well, now we have probably increased by a thousandfold the amount of paper and information that comes in. And this poor man's wrist would come off. So it's all done electronically and digitally and instantly, and it shows up on your computer screen. And the result is the analysts are deluged, overwhelmed with information. And the job is to pick what's most important. And in my experience, what happened very often was what bobs to the top of this pile is what is sexiest. And what is sexiest is what is the most classified. And uh, the most, and, and that piece of information for which you have clearances but someone may not. This is not uh, a prescription for good analysis necessarily, but it is part of the way that this system keeps itself uh, employed. Collectors get highly classified information, analysts like to handle that information. They give it to policies who policymakers who salivate when they read it and want more, and then it goes back to the collectors again. What I think our biggest weakness is actually not, um, not our sources, however. We have lots of sources of different, different sorts. The biggest problem probably is us, us, collectively. We Americans have a big problem thinking about North Korea. It hypnotizes us in a way. It, um, it causes some of our rational thought processes to freeze up. It is too often conceived of by people as the planet Pluto, a place very dark, very cold, and very far away. When I, as soon as I said that, I remembered something. I, I used that um, description once before the planet Pluto, and a blogger instantly sent me a message very snidely reminding me that Pluto is no longer a planet. <laughs> so I beg your pardon. <laughs> My sense has always been, uh, and I had this um, pretty clearly explained to me one time by policy, uh, someone in the policy er arena, was that in many respects, um, analysts are not able simply to observe North Korea. It's very insidious. Um, it's not as if there's anything overt, uh, nothing hung on the wall or no daily loudspeaker reminder of this. But people feel obliged to judge everything they see and say about North Korea. Not analyze, judge. 
And the judgment must, for some reason, always be negative. Everything has to be somehow put in a negative context, because if it isn't, then there is somehow a supposition that you are approving something in North Korea. And of course, you can't do that. Um, North Korea is beyond the pale. And so it doesn't help um, overall analysis of the place. Now, I'm not, I don't want to overemphasize that point, but it has always seemed to me to hover around the edges of our effort. The other problem is a lot of the um, reporting that we get about North Korea from whatever sources always has a tinge of weirdness to it. As a result, when you go to North Korea, you're, re you're really primed to walk into something very weird. And it, of course it isn't. It isn't quite weird at all. So there's a, a, a warping of the analysis that takes place in Washington that I think um, has a deleterious effect on some of the policy, or the uh, analytical conclusions which may affect the policy, but I don't want to talk about policy here. Well, what are some of the other problems that I can recall and I think are worth noting? The analysis tends to be too Pyongyang-centric. We always think about what's happening in Pyongyang, and we forget the fact that there are about 150 counties and at least 10, maybe more, cities in North Korea where 21 million people reside outside of Pyongyang. That isn't to lessen the importance of Pyongyang, it's only to remind ourselves and remind ourselves that the analysis should take into account that Pyongyang is a bigger, I mean North Korea is a bigger place. The system functions within the country on the basis of all of these other places feeding in and, with, and the leadership having to deal with problems in these other places. We tend not to see that uh, in, in, in Washington. There's too much circular information. Information tends to feed itself. Um, what, we, what, we, what we thought we learned was true is put down over here, and then it's picked up over here, and then it's reconfirmed because you heard it over here, and then it makes full circle again. It's hard to break this circle. Um, it's a very natural tendency in a place um, like this, and that's why it's important for analysts to get out and to hear other opinions and perspectives. There's too much echo chamber analysis. Uh, it's supposed to be clearances. People are supposed to um, raise questions about other people's analysis. There's a lot of uh, attaboy, oh, that's a good point, oh, yes, I agree. certainly agree with that. And what started out as a regular, as sort of a shaky um, hypothesis, and there's nothing wrong with starting with a shaky hypothesis, but it gets stronger over time, not because the evidence is better, but because of the pats on the back get stronger. We have too little uh, grasp on history, and James pointed that out, uh, highlighted that point. If you haven't read the, if you're interested in North Korea, and you haven't read the Cold War History Project, then you haven't done your job. You have to read that. You must read it, and you'll enjoy it. It, it's human. It's funny uh, to see the Soviet ambassador interacting with Kim Il-sung sometimes is hilarious, absolutely hilarious. Um, and it brings you to a number of essential conclusions and uh, sort of realizations that the North Koreans that we deal with today are not all that different from the North Koreans that existed in days of yore, which should not be a surprise at all. 
If you read American history, there are continuities. You read history of any country in the world, and there are great continuities over time. Why shouldn't that be so of North Korea? And therefore, why shouldn't we learn more about that history as much as we can? And that's where the Cold War, Cold War history makes its contribution. I would caution, however, <clears throat> that what we're seeing in, in some of the Cold War history is the, the, the cables written from the field by diplomats, um, you know, Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, all these places. And diplomats are diplomats are diplomats. Cables from the field, from a f you know, foreign, foreign ministry officials in the field, resemble each other worldwide. Because you want to go back to the capital and get a good position. And the only way you can do that is if you can prove that you were so tough to these locals and you told them how things were supposed to be and they sort of cowered or they listened closely or they fumbled and didn't know what to say. Well, you have to get through that. You have to peel that away. And you can't always take uh, literally what they say about the North Koreans. And so finding the balance point is also part of the fun of, of reading, reading these documents, I think. Uh, we are we're a little bit too much burdened by the perception that North Korea is a place of uh, information, that it is an information black hole. We scare ourselves away from understanding that we know more about it than we think we do, or there's more information available than we think that there is. Anytime you have uh, someone stand up and tell you that North Korea is an information black hole, you should check for your wallet and count the silverware. Because what they're actually saying is, uh, nobody knows anything about North Korea, and therefore I can say virtually anything I want and can't be contradicted. You shouldn't fall for that, I don't think. Technically, we get high marks. Not perfect marks, but pretty good marks. We get off the path when it comes to the very human enterprise of analysis and of prediction. We spend a lot of time worrying about capabilities. I think, obviously, we have to worry about North Korean military capabilities, but it's a trap to focus on that exclusively. It's a trap to focus too tightly on technical issues, just like it's a trap to focus simply on political or historical evidence and information. If there is an integration of these things, then we're sunk because the world exists and not in isolated pockets or baskets, but it, it all fits together. We learn that uh, lesson um, and managed to apply it, I think, very astutely in the mid-90s when we got scientific, technical, and uh, regional people finally together and finally putting together their perceptions so that the scientists were not running off um, far, far, far away um, based on their technical understanding with no understanding about North Korea at all. It's just making um, sort of wild predictions about uh, what was happening in North Korea. On the other hand, the, the regional people who didn't have a clue about these technical things um, were, were making their own wild predictions about what North Korea was going to do when in fact the laws of physics apply in North Korea just like they do everywhere else. The North Koreans can't escape that. So it's bringing these things together that has ended up being very important. We have to be concerned, as much concerned with the what that has happened in North Korea. We have to learn to start describing patiently and carefully sort of the, the details without ascribing um, purpose or, or uh, intent or anything to it. Just flatly describe what went on and begin to build on that just like you build a brick wall. Let me end up with a, oh, <laughs> a 
joke, which I like. And it, I think it applies to this very question we're talking about. A CEO of a company calls an ac the accountant into his office, and he says, Mr. Brown, I'm going to meet with the, um, the board out here in a, in a minute. And uh, what I need from you is one word description of the state of this company. And Brown opens his books and he says, well, you know, that's pretty hard to do. One word, it's a very complicated issue. There are a lot of nuances. There are some things I don't know yet. CEO says, no, I don't want to hear that. I want one word. I want a word that describes it. Brown, Brown says, well, I'll try, but look, it's, we've got all this information and it's, it's very hard to put it together. Brown, I'm telling you, if you don't give me that in 10 seconds, you're fired. I want one word that describes this company, Brown says. Okay. Good. CEO says, see how easy that was? And he goes out the door to the meeting. The vice president sticks his head in and he says, I heard what you said, Brown. If you had two words to describe the state of this company, what would they be? And Brown says, not good. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Our next speaker is Day Suksa. Well, uh, North Korea is not good. Uh, um, I'm happy to be back at the uh, Wilson Center. Uh, actually, I was here in the, when the Wilson Center was in the castle, and that's where I wrote the Kim Il Sung book. Uh, and that was 1985, and it was published in 88, and uh, it's still selling. So um, I am one of those uh, uh, people who study North Korea. Uh, if there is something I don't know, I try to find out. And um, uh, I don't say I know a lot. The North Korea is still an enigmatic uh, uh, hermit kingdom uh, where people are difficult. Even if you go to North Korea, uh, I've been there many times, but um, you cannot tell uh, what it is that North Korea uh, uh, makes it going. Lots of it is going on right now. Uh, today, uh, in North Korea, it is September 9th, uh, and September 9th is their founding day. It's like their July 4th. So it, the big uh, celebration is going on right now. Uh, it's not because they have chosen the successor. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that uh, we will talk about the successor too, but uh, it's uh, actually, uh, it is the 62nd anniversary of the founding of the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The reason I accepted this invitation and came uh, is to uh, relieve some of the sense of urgency that I feel uh, about North Korea. Uh, one is North Korea is convening party conference now, party conference is different from party congress. Party congress has not been convened ever since 1980. Uh, so it's been about uh, 30 years that they didn't convene. Uh, party conference is even older. Uh, they didn't convene party congress since 1966. So it is, uh, party conference is, is first time in, in, in something like uh, 66 years. And why? Uh, that is uh, some of the things that are, it's not as simple as party conference is held to approve Kim Jong-il's choice of his successor. It is not that. There is something afoot, and, and, and uh, I don't know yet, but the, we, we should find out about that. We should talk about that. Another thing about uh, North Korea is if those of you who are watching North Korea, uh, the most routinely 
scheduled um, uh, event in North Korea is the meeting of the Supreme People's Assembly. It's like a Congress here. And, and every year, like in South Korea, every four years, they have an election for, uh, in, in North Korea, it, it is once in every five years. Now, <clears throat> they have 687 representatives in, in, in North Korea, and mm -hmm. uh, we all just dismiss uh, that, uh, well, they're, they're just uh, uh, appointed, and uh, uh, they're, they're dismissed after uh, the, we don't even know, know who who they are. Um, but if you study it a little bit, uh, you would understand that there are 687 people that in the last election that uh, in 2009, there were more peop first timers elected to that uh, Supreme People's Assembly than uh, the people who were members of the Supreme People's Assembly. Uh, the, the reason for uh, my concern and, and, uh, is 12th Supreme People's Assembly was held in April uh, 2009, last year. This year, it, it usually holds once a year. So, 10th Supreme People's Assembly was held five years, uh, 1998, and uh, uh, five times. And uh, since uh, 11th is also the same way. And the 12th uh, actually started in April, uh, more or less to celebrate the Kim Il Sung's birthday on April 15th, and that they hold this uh, uh, meeting on, on uh, April. And in April, uh, they had the uh, 2009, they had the first session. Second session was held April of this year, that is 2010. Now, all of a sudden, the first time in Kim Jong il's uh, uh, reign of power in North Korea, this Supreme People's Assembly session is held two months later, actually, in July. July of this year, North Korea held uh, the third session of the 12th Supreme People's Assembly. Why? Uh, they, uh, the measures that they pass in that uh, um, 12th, uh, third session of the Supreme People's Assembly are, are important measures that they passed. In other words, they have changed the, the, almost all of the cabinet uh, in North Korea. And appointed a new prime minister, and also even a member of the uh, National Defense Council was replaced. Uh, one was promoted, uh, one retired. So there is important things going on in North Korea, and why that is going on. Uh, in um, the, we, we talk very freely about succession uh, in North Korea. And, and a lot of people, uh, I don't like to talk about succession because I don't know. Uh, uh, and I um, categorically, I think one Japanese newspaper uh, media person asked me uh, last year at the time of the eighth uh, International Human Rights and Refugees Conference held in London, uh, that they asked me about uh, succession. And I, I, uh, I, I said that, uh, you know, the, uh, selecting Kim Il-sung, I mean, uh, uh, Kim Jong-il's, uh, the youngest son, as the successor is false. And uh, I, I doubt very much that that will happen. I, I'm still holding on to that theory uh, because I'm going to tell you what the North Koreans say about the succession, because uh, it's—I I don't think the, our speculation is as good as theirs. <laughs> After the first succession, it's not because of Kim Jong Il himself. We we see that the dramatic changes occurred in North Korea after Kim Il Sung died. Uh, now, when we were talking about succession of Kim Jong Il. 
A lot of people uh, said they will be just the same as Kim Il Sung. Even today, you will see that uh, you will say that North Korea is same when it was under Kim Il Sung, and it's same today. Uh, how wrong you are! Uh, what are the basic changes that occurred in North Korea in uh, after Kim Il Sung had died? I will just name uh, several uh, and. Uh, um, uh, succession takes a long time. In the case of from Kim Il-sung to Kim Jong-il, it took almost 20 years. Uh, it, it's from about 1974 it started out, and Kim Il-sung dies in 1994. And even then, after he died, uh, there were uh, three years of mourning, one year of preparation, and it was not, not until 1998 when the uh, new uh, government was established under Kim Jong Il, so it, it succession is not such an easy uh, task of naming uh, youngest son, the next to the youngest son, uh, the daughter, or whatever. Uh, it's not that that simple. Simple. And the basic fundamental change that occurred in North Korea after Kim Jong Il took over is that uh, prominence of the military. Kim Jong-il's government is predominantly military, professional military in active duty run state. It's not, Kim Il-sung at least used the political party, uh, used the Communist Party of North Korea to run the country. Kim Jong-il, uh, you know, party for example, uh, in, since 1980, they didn't hold the party conference. Uh, so it's um, 30 years that they ne neglected uh, the party activity. So there are some basic fundamental changes. Uh, and um, notable changes that occurred that did not, uh, they were, that were not implemented in North Korea are, are following. Uh, there was economic relaxation on property ownership. The North Korean constitution was amended uh, to implement this, but this was simply uh, the um, uh, uh, in documents only, actually it was not uh, implemented. There was a freedom of travel and domicile. The North Koreans could go any place they wanted to go without permission and actually choose a place where they wanted to live. Now this also did not. Uh, also North Koreans were, uh, were able to own a uh, private uh, property in a, in a domestic plot where they can near their house where they can plant uh, in their yard some of the vegetables that they could uh, not they don't have to submit to the government now it North Koreans did not uh, uh, implement this but basically the change that occurred in North Korea after the succession is significant in in, uh, in North Korea, and what will happen if the other if this time the succession uh, were to come about? That is what we we should be talking about, not whether it is the third son or the second son or whatever, uh, illegitimate son or the legitimate son and all that. Um, North Korean version, uh, uh, whenever I don't know uh, anything about uh, like, like this succession question, there are so many uh, rumors and so many uh, theories about uh, this succession. I always go back and try to see what North Koreans tell us about this succession. Okay? Here is what they say. Whether you agree or not, it's immaterial. I'm just merely presenting to you what the North Koreans are saying. The role of the leader consists of creating a revolutionary ideas uh, and developing. One, 
Two, awakening the masses and unite them into an organized force. Three, putting forward correct program of struggle and strategies and tactics and organizing and mobilizing the people uh, in for their implementation. What kind of person should be a successor in North Korea? Successor, one successor should be infinitely loyal to the leader. Two successor must master the ideas of the leader. Three successors should embody the lofty virtue. That's very easy because a North Korean leader doesn't have the virtue that you approve anyway. The fourth successor should be chosen as a publicly recognized leader in the course of winning the trust of the masses. If the person has a conspicuous quality and character as a leader and performed great exploits, it matters little, um, be careful now, it matters little whether the person is male or female, young or old. One's revolutionary record is long or short. And whether he is related in blood to the leader or not. This is what the North Koreans say about the uh, the leader. And uh, they add two more uh, items. Selection of successor should be from the younger generation. In other words, not the Kim Jong-il's generation, but the next generation. And the successor should be nominated while Kim Jong-il is alive and while the leader is alive. So these are North Korean version of succession. Uh, whether they will follow this, uh, their own prescription or not, that still don't know. But at least you know what they are thinking about their their success, succession. What is the second succession then? Okay, uh, uh, and the future. I think North Korea will, whoever becomes a successor, uh, will try to maintain. Uh, the sustaining myth that uh, keeps North Korea going. Uh, that is Chuche idea and tradition of Kim Il-sung. Perhaps next generation leader will revive the party while Kim Jong-il had actually demolished it. They'll revive the party and uh, may run the country, military and party, in a joint effort. Um, also, there will not be a, such a great big uh, change in North Korean leadership uh, who supports this successor. Uh, it, right now, I, I, I made a list of uh, the people who are supporting um, uh, Kim Jong-il right now, and uh, there's some other people who will uh, uh, not be re-elected into National Defense Council, uh, and uh, there are some people who will, who will uh, resign. For example, uh, North Korean Navy Commander Kim Il-chol uh, had retired very recently after this uh, naval confrontation with uh, South Korea. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the, all the names of the people. I, I just don't have enough time. And also the, the administration of North Korea, the government, uh, they appointed a new uh, prime minister, Choi Young-nim, um, who is a veteran. Of, uh, uh, he was a deputy prime minister, and he was once uh, replaced in 1983, 84 uh, months. But uh, uh, North Korea recently, the last Supreme People's Assembly, uh, appointed a new prime minister and uh, six vice ministers, new vice ministers to support him. Uh, so the, the successor 
uh, question is uh, not as simple as uh, we make it to be that the, it's a uh, whose third son, the legitimate son, and uh, it uh, was come from. It's not that. If, if you want to know about uh, uh, the uh, who's who in succession uh, hierarchy, I'll tell you. Uh, I'll tell you as much as I know. Uh, but uh, it's not very likely that they are going to uh, name this person in this uh, time. This time, they have a lot more important uh, agenda going on in North Korea today. Thank you. Good. Okay, our final speaker is uh, JJ Sir. Well, let me first apologize for two things. One, for coming in late. I have a teaching obligation that conflicts with this event. And even though I moved the class up by an hour, I still came in late. Uh, these uh, graduation, graduate level seminars are impossible to stop once they get going. Two, we apparently had a slight communication problem. and. Uh, uh, PowerPoint setup is not uh, available, and so uh, in true Juche fashion, I'll do what I can with uh, whatever I have at the moment, <laughs> which means I'm going to just turn my laptop around, and hopefully you will be able to see some of the slides that I have. <laughs> this will be a little tricky because uh, I have to see in order to control this, but... Um, well, let's give it a try. I'll um, get to a topic that's uh, more um, contemporary and uh, very relevant to today's policies. And uh, in this part of the town, in this part of the world, I suppose it is a given that um, uh, the Cheonan, the uh, South Korean naval ship, was um, destroyed by a North Korean torpedo. And I suppose uh, a majority, absolute majority in this room subscribes to uh, that view. I don't know if there is uh, any dissenters. Um, but in some parts of the world, such as Moscow and Beijing, the fact doesn't seem to be accepted as such. And even in South Korea, there are many who have doubts about this official conclusion. And uh, a recent poll shows that uh, there are more who have doubts about this conclusion than they believe that uh, North Koreans actually destroyed the Chonan ship. So how is it possible that there still are people who don't believe the obvious? What I'd like to do today is uh, to walk you through some of the facts that are related to the Chonan incident that have been mobilized by the joint South Korean government-appointed joint investigation group to support its conclusion that uh, North Korean torpedo destroyed and sank the Chonan, and see how much we actually know about this incident. And uh, I hope by the end of my talk that uh, you would, uh, some of you would at least have uh, some questions about the facts that you thought you knew. So what are some of the basic things A little tricky. Well, let me ask some of the basic questions. When did it occur? Where did it occur? How did it occur? Since the JIG, Joint Investigation Group, claims that the Chonan was severed by an outside explosion of a torpedo. I'll spend some time on analyzing the three things that would be produced by an outside explosion of a torpedo, namely bubble effect, shock wave, and fragments. 
Is there any evidence that links the torpedo, the famous torpedo that was recovered from under the sea, and link that torpedo to Chen'an's damages? And finally, I'll conclude with a question. What do we really know? So where did it occur? Excuse me, when did it occur? The JIG reports that it happened at 2120 on March 26, 2010. But the Navy Operations Headquarters recorded in its document that it occurred at 2115. But the Joint Chiefs of Staff has yet another time, 2145. The Board of Audit found that the JCS had actually forged its document to change the time. And Representative Choi Moon Soon says uh, he has evidence that the JCS changed the time from 2115 to 2145 by adding these lines. I don't know if you can see this. Mm -hmm. It's easy to change 15 to 45 by adding two lines. But the real question is, when did it really occur? And different parts of South Korean government say different things. And therefore, we don't actually know exactly when it happened. Where did it occur? The Korean Navy Tactical Data System that tracks all Navy ship's movement shows that the Chonan disappeared at this point. But the Navy claims the ship sank at another location, there. And the patrols on the Pengyong, who were standing guard at the moment of the incident, testified that they had observed rescue operations further down south, down here. So where did it really occur? We're not sure. How did the incident occur? The JIG claims that an outside explosion produced a shock wave and a bubble effect that uh, severed the Chonan like this. So it produces, produces a shockwave first, and then a bubble is formed, and it expands and shrinks a number of times. And uh, the combination of shockwave and bubble destroy the ship. Now, these are pictures of um, <coughs> a South Korean torpedo experiment. And it shows an incoming torpedo comes toward this ship and explodes, sends a shock wave, creating huge column of water. And then the ship <laughs> is uh, severed in half. So that's how the JIH claims the North Korean torpedo destroyed the Chonan. So now let's see if there was a bubble effect and a shock wave that the JIG claims. The JIG claims that there was a bubble effect that affected Chonan like this, and the pressure from the bubble, pressure from the bubble severed the ship. And uh, this is the picture of the actual ship and this is the uh, simulation result. Note two, thi two things. One, the simulation does not show that uh, the bubble effect actually severs the ship. It does certain damages to the ship, but it doesn't, show, it doesn't sever the, the ship. And if the bubble severs the ship, it will sever the ship where the stress is the highest. And the highest stress is uh, noted by this uh, red color. 
So if the bubble severed the shape, it should have, would have severed the shape right along this line. But as you see, <coughs> the shape was severed actually here. So there is a peculiar disjoint between the simulation and the damages of the ship itself. Here is another picture of the JIG simulation. As you can see, the hull is uh, deformed in a spherical shape because a bubble hit the bottom of the ship. And uh, the top part of the deformation has a tear. And finally, this again shows that the, the bubble does not sever the ship. Now let's look at the bottom of the ship that would have received the bubble most directly. This is the bottom of the ship that was uh, right in the middle that would have received a direct bubble impact. Obviously, the ship was uh, severed in two places, contrary to JEIG simulations that does not show any severance. Two, there is uh, no deformation in the bubble shape, contrary to the JIG simulation. And three, there is no tear, no tear in the middle, contrary to JIG simulation. So was there really the bubble effect? I do not know. At least the JIG has failed to, to produce facts that would support the bubble effect. Now what about the shock wave? A majority of uh, uh, energy produced by an explosion of a torpedo is uh, used uh, to create a shock wave. And uh, the initial graph that I showed also shows a high level of shock. Now using a simple formula uh, developed by Aus Australian uh, Navy, I estimate that um, uh, 250 kilo kilograms of TNT would have uh, created pressure on the Chonan itself anywhere between 8,000 and 18,000 PSI. So now how destructive is um, 8,000 PSI? This is uh, what a mere five PSI would do to a house. House is standing, it's starting to receive a five PSI shock coming from um, a large explosion. This is the end result. And this is Chonan ship that's supposed to have received 8,000 PSI of shock. And again, there is an incongruence between the claim of shock wave and the fact of damage on the ship. A shock wave also produces a secondary effect. Instruments and weapons on the ship will experience the, the reverberation from a shock wave and as a res result fall or be deformed. The Chonan shows no signs of a secondary effect. Even all the magazines are perfectly lined up. It's just inconsistent with uh, um, what's expected from a shockwave effect. Even the fluorescent light bulb survived the ship's destruction. I don't know if you can see this. There is a tiny fluorescent light bulb that remains intact. And uh, these things do not 
add up to the claim that um, there was a, a large shock wave coming from um, an explosion of, of a torpedo. What about the fragments? This was a rather large torpedo that the JIG claims, and they should have produced and left a lot of fragments. But there are no fragments on the ship, and there are no fragments under the sea. So where are the fragments? And uh, when the JIG managed to uh, retrieve the torpedo parts, it did not retrieve, it did not catch any other fragments, just these uh, torpedo parts. So if the fragments are not on the ship or not under the sea, on, under the sea where are they? I do not know, and this is a fact that's not consistent with uh, JIG's claim. Now what about the water column that a torpedo explosion would have produced? South Korea's experiment clearly shows a high and wide water column. But the sailor on the deck at the time of the incident testified that he felt a few drops on his face. Two patrols on Pengyong Island testified that they observed a flash of light. There was no mention of water. And identified its location far away from the location of the incident. So what do we know about the Chonan incident? We're not sure exactly when it happened. We're not sure exactly where it happened. There is no sign of the bubbly effect, no sign of shockwave, no fragments. So was there really an outside explosion? The only thing that I could say is that there are no facts that support an outside explosion. Now what about the famous torpedo parts? Don't they prove that the North Korean torpedo somehow destroyed the Chonan? Now the only material evidence that links the Chonan to the torpedo is uh, this white powder that was um, uh, recovered from the torpedo parts and some uh, parts of the ship. And uh, the JIG did um, a two scientific analysis of the powder to show that um, uh, th the powders from the ship match the powder from the torpedo. That would be the material evidence that link torpedo to Chonan's destruction, right? One of the analysis that the JIG did was um, what's called EDS, Energy Dispersive uh, Spectroscopy, and uh, that essentially identifies atoms that make up a material, the powder in this case. And as you can see, the three samples show identical peaks at identical locations. So the same peaks at the same location indicates they are the same atom, aluminum, oxygen, uh, carbon, and other things. And uh, the height of each peak indicates uh, the amount of that atom in that the substance in the test material. And as you can see, the three are consistent. They are made up of same atoms, and they contain same amount of these atoms. Good. So this must be at least one of the evidences that um, torpedo is uh, somehow related. Torpedo somehow affected the Chonan ship. Unfortunately, no, because an explosion
an explosion would produce aluminum oxide, Al2O3. And uh, the ratio of uh, aluminum and oxide that would show up on, on EDS is um, this one. So the ratio of um, aluminum to oxygen should be about 0 0.23. If the white stuff was aluminum oxide that has resulted from an explosion. But as you can see, the ratio between aluminum and oxygen is um, almost one to one. It's 0 0.91 to be exact. And that ratio matches this data, which actually is um, the um, uh, atomic composition of um, aluminum hydroxide. And aluminum hydroxide has uh, nothing to do with explosion. It occurs naturally in nature. It's uh, found in uh, natural ore, and uh, it can be formed as a result of uh, aluminum being exposed to water and, and oxygen for a long time. So JIG's uh, EDS analysis actually shows, proves, that, that the white powder that it recovered from the ship and from the torpedo has not, nothing to do with the explosion. The second test that the JRG did was um, uh, X-ray diffraction analysis. Now this analyzes uh, the uh, molecular structure of uh, the test material using X-ray, X-ray beams. And uh, as you can clearly see, the first two data are different from the third. Right? The third one has um, high peaks here, there, and there. And those um, high peaks indicate aluminum. But the first two do not have uh, those high peaks. What do they tell? These data show that um, the stuff found from the Chonan and torpedo are different from the stuff that the JRG obtained from a test explosion. In other words, JRG's XRD analysis shows, proves, that um, the white material's molecular structure has nothing to do with the explosion. So the two scientific analyses that the JIG has uh, performed actually shows that um, the white stuff discovered on the, sh on the ship and on the torpedo uh, has uh, nothing to do with explosion. And so was there really an explosion? And was, um, uh, did this uh, torpedo really destroy the ship? I do not know. I haven't seen facts yet. The JIG, um, yeah, I'm now almost done. The JIG makes a very logical argument. It makes uh, basically three arguments. One, there was an outside explosion. That outside explosion was a dead of a torpedo, and that torpedo was uh, made by North Korea. And therefore, the conclusion is that um, um, North Korean torpedo destroy the Chonan ship. Now, in order to support the conclusion, the JIG had to prove all three. If it fails to prove any one of them, it cannot sustain the conclusion. But as I showed, it failed to prove at least the first two claims. And uh, the third one, I don't have time for, but I'll be happy to uh, get into during the Q&A. And so what we now have is a very peculiar uh, situation where JIG's first claim has no evidence, 
Second claim has no evidence. Third claim has no evidence. The only thing that remains is JIG's conclusion without facts. That's the fact. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's open the floor to questions. Um, if you will raise your hand and um, before speaking, um, I'd appreciate it if you could tell us your name and any affiliations you might have. Um, and please wait, we do have uh, microphones coming around to you. First one's down here. Oh, Michael. Uh, thank you. I'm Mike Billington with the Executive Intelligence Review. Um, Mr. Jae Jung, so I don't know if you went to the conference down at Quantico last week um, uh, on Korea, but the, at that conference I raised exactly the same question you've drawn, the uh, belief of the Chinese and the Russians and others that the evidence is inadequate. The response from two different generals was, we don't need no stinking evidence. <laughs> Um, look at the last 50 years, look at the provocations, this is in North Korea's character, therefore we have to accept that this is true. Um, I want to ask two questions. Um, one, you didn't mention the issue which has concerned me about this, which is why in this area of very high South Korean and U.S. and NATO uh, anti-submarine warfare facilities and sonar equipment and so forth, uh, there appears to have been no sonar evidence whatsoever of either a submarine or a torpedo, and I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Uh, and secondly, for the whole panel, if you have uh, views on this, I'm wondering what, uh, we all know North Korea says we had nothing to do with this, but I'm wondering what you think North Korea thinks about this. In other words, who, who could have done it, why, why is, if it was an accident, who in the West, is it the U.S., is it the British, uh, in other words, what is the view of the North Koreans as to how this is being played and why in terms of creating a disruption at a time where North and South Korea were actually moving towards better relations when this, when this happened? Well, North Korea is the, the bad boy in the neighborhood. And uh, therefore, and uh, I don't dispute, you know, that, that uh, view. Uh, North Korea has done enough bad things in the past that it deserves that label. But that doesn't give us the right to blame them for anything bad that happens in the neighborhood. Right? It could have been an accident. And, and it's still possible that North Koreans actually did it. But it is um, the burden of proof is uh, on the JIG, and the burden of the proof lies on, on, on the party that points the finger at North Korea. And uh, um, even though I remain open to the possibility that uh, North Korea actually might have done it, I need to be convinced by uh, facts. And uh, perhaps um, um, others um, are also uh, with waiting to uh, be convinced by facts. And unfortunately, uh, the Joint Investigation Group has uh, so far failed to convince me or uh, some of these doubters um, with facts. Now, some of the facts that uh, JIG could uh, provide is um, exactly that, sonar evidence of um, a torpedo coming in um, and uh, uh, at the time of the incident, um, the U.S. military and the South Korean military were engaged in a joint naval exercise, precisely anti-submarine warfare exercise. And uh, Chonan is uh, a corvette whose main mission is uh, to search for submarines. And uh, therefore, uh, one would think that... Um, um, there might be some evidence, sonar, radar, whatever, that would show North Korean submarine um, or torpedo or both. But um, nothing has been um, um, uh, made public so far. Does anybody else want to address the question? Okay, um, up the back. There. Hi, my name is Hawan Lee. Uh, 
the Joseon Ilbo. I'd like to make a question to Professor Asel. I have uh, several questions. First of all, are you a physicist? I'm, uh, I'm wondering what's your uh, major. And uh, secondly, if you, uh, if you believe it so, how many times did you make an experiment at the, at, the uh, at the laboratory? And uh, what kind of a size, uh, uh, with what kind of a size did you make an experiment at the uh, laboratory? And uh, if you believe it so, why do you think the JIG and the South Korean government uh, fabricated the facts? For what reason? And uh, do you think is it possible for almost 80 scientists they fabricated the facts? And if, uh, lastly, if you believe so, why the other countries like United States and Sweden and Australia, they agree to the fabricated uh, conclusion by the JIC? Thank you. Well, I'm not a physicist, I'm a political scientist, um, although I studied physics as an undergrad, but you know that was a long time ago, and I was not even a good student. Um, I can read uh, scientific data, and uh, I understand uh, some math, and I can do uh, simple arithmetic. And uh, it doesn't take Einstein to understand uh, this uh, scientific data, and it doesn't take Einstein to do basic math to estimate the size of a shock wave and uh, to estimate the size of a bubbly effect. And that doesn't take um, a rocket scientist to see uh, the data from uh, XRD and EDS. Um, I stopped short of um, charging the JIG um, of uh, fabricating the data. Uh, all I have said was that um, the, the JIG has failed to provide facts that would support its conclusion. And uh, um, as I said, um, I remain open to the possibility that the North Koreans actually uh, did it. But what I'm uh, here trying to point out is that uh, there is um, a disconnect between uh, the conclusion and evidence. And uh, as uh, we are on the issue of uh, credibility of uh, intelligence, I think um, uh, it's uh, more or more important that um, you know, we try to look at the facts. Uh, we can speculate and talk about succession but the facts are very uh, scarce, and uh, there are uh, scares that would uh, support many of these speculations uh, that uh, Kim Jong-un is the, the next successor. And uh, there are some facts that um, uh, perhaps can be interpreted um, in a different way, as uh, Professor So uh, suggested. And uh, when we uh, look at uh, Chonan and other uh, cases that involve North Korea, uh, we need to look at facts. And uh, um, again, um, you know, North Korea is the bad boy, but um, that doesn't exonerate us from the responsibility of um, uh, supporting our claims with facts. I do not know why they agreed, um, but um, you should perhaps ask them um, why they agreed and uh, ask them if they have facts that the JIG has not released in public that uh, they saw that uh, I have not seen. And uh, if there are such facts, I would love to see them, and I might be persuaded by those facts. Uh, Michelle Parrish, New Zealand Embassy. My question is for speaker number three, Professor Daesuk Sir. Um, you mentioned that in the last elections, um, over half were people brought in for the first time. I was wondering if you could perhaps comment on some of your observations about the types of people, were perhaps they key military figures or were they younger personnel being introduced? That is a 
Good question. It's a large number, 687 people in, in the North Korean Supreme People's Assembly. And uh, the half of it, it would be about 340 people. And uh, I was able to calculate uh, that uh, those people who were not uh, re-elected, of them, uh, important uh, persons uh, such as uh, Chang Sung Woo. Chang Sung Woo is the uh, uh, brother of uh, Chang Sung Tak, who is the husband of uh, Kim Il Sung's daughter, Kim Kyung Hee. Now, uh, also uh, the former former uh, North Korean ambassador to the UN, uh, Park Kil Yeon, he was not re-elected. Uh, there were there were there were a lot of important people who were not elected, and uh, I cannot give you reasons why. I mean, the, I don't know the the the, the uh, politics went behind it, and and uh, they were dismissed. Uh, but um, uh, I, I'm just giving you uh, some idea that some of the important people were not uh, re-elected. Uh, also, younger people, uh, I think uh, uh, more in Kim Jong-il's uh, uh, age group people were uh, elected to the, uh, for the first time to the Supreme People's Assembly. They have the, the number, the, they have the statistics of the Supreme People's Assembly as to, as to the age group how many people from what age group and how many people were college graduates and, and uh, how many people were uh, party workers and all, all of that. Uh, but it gives you just a percentage. It doesn't even give you a number. So it's hard to uh, uh, understand that. Uh. Uh, can I add yeah, I think yeah. I, I think what we can say is that indeed it's a bad year for incumbents. <laughs> <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Good one. Uh, Bob Hathaway here at the Wilson Center. I have to say I'm profoundly depressed uh, by the cumulative impact of the four presentations because it suggests that we know so little and that we're probably not going to know uh, a, a great deal in the, in the near term. Um, my question is to Bob Carlin. Um, in part because Bob was for so many years regarded as the font of all wisdom in the U.S. government about uh, North Korean matters. Um, Bob, two related questions. Um, within the U.S. government, specifically the intel community, um, are the problems you discussed uh, about what you, I think, call the warping of the analysis um, taking place, are they particularly pronounced with respect to our analysis of DPRK, or uh, are the problems more or less equally severe with our analysis toward a good many uh, other, other countries? And secondly, um, the problems you discussed, are they more prevalent within the U.S. intel community, or are you really talking about a set of problems um, which characterizes the analytical process in uh, uh, at least the governments of our close allies and those with whom we uh, share sensitive intelligence. You know, I can't in good conscience comment on um, what goes on in the, the intelligence offices on other countries. I don't know if, this, if similar problems exist. I, I would say that uh, the scary experience we had on a particular issue on Iraq suggests that there might be some <laughs> overlap. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know if, for example, on China or Russia we have the same problems. I doubt it. I don't think we're as hypnotized by many other countries as we are by North Korea. As far as our allies go, <clears throat> wow. 
I, I get an inkling of the fact that uh, in some countries similar problems exist, that it's very easy not to be rigorous and systematic in looking at North Korea. It's easier just to uh, fall into the, they're bad, they did it, we don't need no stinking facts, you know. Um, and that's always rewarded. That's the, the policy um, predilection is to accept that rather than to say, wait a minute, go back and look at that again. But well, how widespread that is with the Allies, again, I'm sorry, I can't, I really don't know. Yeah. Great. Uh, this gentleman here with the... Uh, Will Amatruda, uh, returning to the, uh, the, the sinking of the ship, uh, what sort of alternative, if, if North Korea uh, did not destroy the ship with a torpedo, has anyone come up with an alternative explanation? I'm thinking of a, an investigation that the U.S. Navy did in the late 70s, 1970s of the explosion of the battleship Maine, which of course caught, was the proximate cause of the Spanish-American War. The, the theory was it was a, spe it was a torpedo set off by, by, by the Spanish government, which really had no interest in it. If anybody did, it was the, it was the Cuban rebels who did. Anyway, the, the conclusion that the Navy made was that it was a coal dust explosion. This was, of course, a coal-fired uh, ship, and it was purely an accident that, that caused a war. Uh, but they, and, and they produced evidence that, that, uh, that uh, convinced uh, uh, most people who had uh, you know, the ability to, to uh, test for it. So I'm asking, has anyone come up with an alter alternative explanation for, for, for this? Well, there, ha there have been a number of um, alternative hypotheses. I wouldn't call them explanations at this point because um, none of this um, has been really uh, supported by evidence. Uh, one hypothesis is um, uh, uh, grounding. Um, and uh, this um, claims that the ship uh, was uh, too close to the island and uh, went to the shallow part where there was um, a corals and uh, it just uh, uh, hit uh, one of those corals and uh, began to uh, uh, sink. And uh, because uh, the water accumulated to the, the rear part of the ship so much, at some point uh, the ship could not sustain uh, the weight any longer and broke. Possible, and uh, there are some um, um, uh, facts that uh, lend credence to uh, that uh, hypothesis. Um, uh, the way uh, the propellers on the back were bent, and uh, the way uh, part of the bottom is uh, deformed uh, indicates uh, some kind of uh, uh, contact with a hard surface. Another uh, hypothesis that's um, uh, reportedly uh, pro uh, proposed by uh, the Russian investigators, um, since uh, this was reported only uh, in one Korean newspaper, um, I don't know if um, it's true, but uh, at least uh, what's um, uh, being circulated is that um, um, sea mine uh, theory. And uh, the argument is that uh, there are, um, were a lot of uh, sea mines are uh, planted under uh, the Park Jung Hee, and uh, some of them um, have been uh, retrieved, but uh, there are still some uh, that have not been uh, retrieved. And uh, by uh, accident, uh, it got tangled up and uh, uh, percolated up and hit the ship, uh, detonating and, and destroying the ship. Um, there isn't a clear sign of an explosion, whether it's a torpedo or sea mine, and so I'm not uh, really uh, sure if uh, this holds the water, but nonetheless, uh, this is uh, one um, a possible <coughs> hypothesis. And uh, another hypothesis is uh, a, a, a collision theory, um, and uh, uh, there were some Marines, South, one South Korean submarine 
and the one U.S. submarine um, that were operating. Uh, South Korean submarine was in the vicinity. Uh, American submarine Colum Columbia was uh, far away, uh, more than 150 kilometers away. Um, there were other ships, naval ships, um, operating uh, in the vicinity. And so it's possible that uh, there was uh, some kind of collision. Um, it's also possible that uh, there were other uh, type of uh, accidents. And uh, this is uh, one picture released by the JIG. And uh, take a look and see what kind of hypothesis uh, you would draw. What does it look like? What if I told you that um, that South Korean submarine has the measurement that fit this? Again, we don't have enough facts to uh, conclude anything, but um, there are these um, uh, hypoth hypotheses. Um, oh. I'm Jenny Park with the USA Journal. I like the question to uh, Bob Collins. Uh, possibility of North Korea using uh, their nuclear weapons. Recently, North Korean ambassador Kwon Sung Chol in Cuba had mentioned. If United States attacked North Korea, they might using their uh, nuclear weapons immediately. And then, can you estimate how many nuclear bombs North Korea has currently? Mm. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> I can tell you what Sig Hecker, who is um, former director of Los Alamos Laboratories and at Stanford University now thinks, I think I remember. <laughs> uh, I, well, we don't know how many bombs they have. We, we have an estimate on the amount of plutonium they have, which they might have weaponized. And I think the estimate now is something like six to eight, potentially. Whether or not they've turned any of those into deliverable weapons, I don't think anybody knows for sure. And I can assure you the ambassador to Cuba doesn't know either. <laughs> well, that's a, actually, real quickly, that's a line that came out in a foreign ministry, I think it came out in a foreign ministry statement a couple of weeks ago. And so therefore that becomes his talking points. He simply repeats what... Um, has come out of Pyongyang. Down the front here. I'm Siwon Byun with the Asia Foundation. I have a basic uh, question for Dr. Carlin. Um, you mentioned that the problem with analyzing North Korea is how we perceive North Korea, not the availability of sources then what are the most reliable um, primary sources on North Korea that are avail readily available to the public um, besides uh, official media and defector reports? And even if there's been an increase in these sources over time, has, do we have we seen an improvement in the quality of, of these sources? Mm. Um, and if I can ask a question to Professor Sa, is there anything you can say about um, current uh, military military contacts between North Korea and China, um, especially if you look at the current um, domestic political transition in both both countries, where you see the growing um, assertiveness of, of military leaders. Thank you. Quickly, um, in answer to your, I guess, two questions, um, you, you said other than official media, and then, but I would I would reel that back in again. There has been and continues today to be no better source on a day-to-day -day basis about North Korean thinking, perceptions, plans, uh, as well as some information about uh, you know events and economic developments than their official media. 
There's no reason not to pay great attention to that. You don't take everything literally, obviously, but it remains a gold mine of of information. It's a very good basis. As as far as your second question goes, what's gotten what's gotten better? There are many many more people going in and out of North Korea. We've got a little bit of a um, a, a cooling in that trend recently, but. The number of NGOs that go in and out, the number of people who have experience on the ground, long experience on the ground, photographs, lots of photographs on the web of the place, which helps give it three dimensions. Um, so that um, compared to, let's say, certainly compared to 10 years ago, there's a lot more information from which a, a good analyst can uh, come up with a number of um, a useful and pretty well based working hypothesis to give you a, it's we're not talking about you know the deepest secrets of the regime here that's that's for someone else to figure out but just to understand what the place is like how it functions how it moves from day to day that information i think is out there and it's increasing every day i don't uh, I don't know the details of uh, North Korean military leaders' uh, cooperation with the Chinese uh, People's Army. Um, the significant difference between these two armies is one in North Korean uh, army generals or the, the vice marshals, they are all very political. They're not only military officers uh, and commander-in-chief of uh, North Korean armed forces, uh, some of them are uh, commander-in-chief of North Korean uh, Air Force, uh, some of them are the Navy, but they, they are members of the National Defense Council. In other words, they, their political position uh, is more important for them uh, than their military position. Only on one uh, uh, side comment, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't know that uh, Professor Sa's um, presentation, but when uh, the Chananham um, explosion came, a North Korean Navy Vice Marshal uh, Vice Marshal, is it? Uh, it's a five-star. Uh, his name is Kim Il Chal. He retired uh, soon after that. Whether there is any connection between his retirement and and uh, and the, to the sinking of the ship, uh, we don't know. And none, nothing was mentioned. Uh, and. Uh, in his place as a member of the uh, uh, National Defense Council, he was a vice chairman. And, and uh, Chang Song Tak, the brother-in-law of uh, uh, Kim Jong Il, uh, replaced him as a vice uh, chairman of the National Defense Commission. Uh, I don't know the kind of cooperation that when the North Korean uh, Air Force jet that uh, crash landed in Manchuria. Uh, I don't know uh, any details of uh, what transpired after that. Okay, great. We'd, uh, I, I know there are several more questions, um, and you're welcome to come up after uh, the event and um, pose them directly to the speakers. Um, but I'm afraid we'd better wrap up now because our cameras. Uh, need to cut things there. Um, if you'd like to join me in thanking our four guests, James Burson, Facebook's uh, Robert Carlin and Jesus. <laughs>